Okay. So welcome once again, I think we can get started. We have 63 participants, welcome everyone. Um, once again, my name is Erin Bogue. I'm the Knowledge Management Specialist with the Polio C4D team. And we're really excited to have you all today for um, this webinar on key insights from NOPV2 communication rollout and misinformation management. So let's take a look at our um, agenda for the day. We'll start off with introduction and objectives for the session. And then we'll hear from colleagues in UNICEF Nigeria about their experience with NOPV2 communication rollout. It'll be about a 20 minute presentation. And then we'll turn to um, UNICEF Ghana for their presentation again about 20 minutes on their experience with establishing a task force for misinformation management. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session where you can ask questions of the panelists um, or more uh, general questions. We also have colleagues from headquarters um, on the line to answer your question. So for our um, speakers, we have Mariana Zachkova, um, our C4D specialist with the polio team in headquarters. We'll be giving an overview of the session and then uh, Mohammed Ridwan Hassan or Iwan and Hayam Nan are um, presenting for the UNICEF Nigeria country office. Um, Anastasia will present our C40 specialist from UNICEF Ghana. will then present on um, the experience from UNICEF Ghana. And we wanna highlight that um, Kashan, the polio misinformation lead from UNICEF headquarters, while he's not giving a presentation is also on the call if you have any um, questions or comments um, about our general direction in misinformation management for polio. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mariana um, for our introduction to the session. Thank you, Erin. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, great to see uh, colleagues joining from all over the world. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I do hope it's going to be a very interesting session, sharing of experience and what we've learned so far about uh, NOPV and NOPV introduction and uh, uh, misinformation. Uh, I'll, I just wanted to kickstart this uh, webinar with a super brief introduction um, and update on where we are on NOPV rollout uh, globally, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, in the, at the end. Next slide, please. Uh, progress so far after, as many of you know, after 10 years in the development uh, on the 13th of November last year, NOPV uh, vaccine has received an uh, emergency use listing from uh, WHO pre-qualification program. And we have started the use of this vaccine in uh, March uh, with uh, the first round um, and first country being Nigeria. We'll hear from the team from Nigeria, uh, their experience and um, how they've been, uh, how they've done uh, it and what challenges they've faced. Uh, super briefly on the process we are undertaking and the support we're providing to the countries uh, during this EUL uh, pro, uh, time, uh, the vaccine is um, uh, in the initial use period and under the emergency use listing. We're expecting countries, uh, and it's a requirement for countries to be ready and verified. Uh, 25 documents uh, um, are expected to be prepared by national teams um, and then verified for by global and by uh, regional teams. So far, we have fully verified six countries, uh, and we have uh, in total 31 country uh, that are uh, working towards the verification. We're also uh, glad to see that we have uh, rolled out the vaccine in uh, six countries already. Uh, the number of the vaccine of the doses is growing uh, by day. Um, approximately 19 million was already used, but as I said, 
uh, as soon as countries are verified, uh, the vaccine is being shipped and uh, the campaigns are being planned. Um, NOPV supply is on track for our uh, to respond to the outbreaks. Um, we are also seeing new studies that are being launched and are underway. Uh, clinical studies are uh, ongoing and as well as the safety studies, every country that is using NOPV now having, um, they're producing safety data uh, that is being analyzed uh, by the team in uh, CDC. Next slide, please. As I said, 31 countries, 25 countries in Africa, one country in Europe, and five countries in uh, Middle East that are uh, being prepared and getting ready uh, for NOPD use. Uh, six countries that are verified and almost all of them had already started their campaigns uh, with the exception of Niger. Benin, uh, Liberia uh, has done two rounds. Nigeria has done two rounds. Uh, Sierra Leone has done one round and Tajikistan uh, is uh, in their first round uh, as we speak. The preparation and the readiness, uh, next slide please, is a rather tedious and uh, lengthy process. Uh, as far as communication is concerned, uh, there are three uh, major strategies that uh, we are developing and we're working on. Uh, advocacy, uh, behavior uh, strategy, and uh, crisis communication. As part of crisis communication, we do have a, a big block of misinformation management, uh, which you will hear more about from Anastasia later today. Uh, there were no major issues um, with the NOPD, uh, again, from a communication uh, perspective. Uh, we are seeing um, hesitancy in the countries uh, that are introducing, but I have to say that uh, in none of the countries we have heard any hesitancy because of the either novelty of the vaccine or uh, specific to this vaccine. A lot of hesitancy and a lot of misinformation that we're seeing that is circulating out there is mostly the confusion between uh, COVID vaccine and um, polio vaccine. I'm sure Anastasia will also share uh, their insights from Ghana and uh, will answer any specific questions uh, if you'll have on this uh, at the end. Um, for the challenges in preparation is there are a lot of country offices on the call that either haven't started the preparation uh, or are just at the beginning of the preparation. The three documents that I've mentioned are uh, rather comprehensive and they do take a lot of time and work and uh, effort from country teams and of course from the governments. So we do have, uh, and I'm sure we've shared, or you've seen those before, their guidance notes, their um, templates for uh, advocacy, for, for crisis communication and for the behavior strategy, but they really uh, take time. So those countries that are just starting, I do urge you to uh, start working and looking through those templates and guidance notes as soon as possible. And uh, the team is on uh, standby uh, to provide you with any support on either of those uh, issues and topics. Ne next slide, please. I just wanted to share with you some of the uh, pictures of uh, the campaigns being carried out in uh, Liberia and Nigeria. Um, we have used in both in all countries that are uh, rolling out an OPD. Um, we've used those very traditional uh, social mobilization mobilization approaches, but also uh, have been looking into innovations, have been looking into digitalization, have uh, used uh, some parts of um, digital social mobilization. We have partnered uh, with uh, big uh, telecoms and uh, mobile operators to spread the message to, we have worked through 
uh, all the digital channels, including WhatsApp, to share the messages about uh, the vaccine and the, the, and the campaigns. Um, I do want to say that none of the countries that have rolled out uh, the vaccine so far put a lot of emphasis on the novelty of the vaccine. Uh, so we, uh, we are taking this as, uh, as a polio campaign, as an outbreak. But there are also guidance and there is also an EUL uh, requirement for us to be transparent if we're asked uh, what type of vaccine this is. So we do encourage countries to include information about NOPV and the questions uh, that are coming up on NOPV specifically into the frontline uh, worker manuals and in the trainings. We also encourage, and this is our EUL commitment, uh, the governments to put information on the EUL and on the vaccine uh, on their websites uh, and to share the, to, to make this information easily available. So uh, while we're not promoting this as a new vaccine, uh, we are encouraging transparency uh, so that whoever wants to find the information can find it uh, online and can find the answers to the questions. Uh, without going into too many details, I think uh, Iwan and uh, Hayon will um, share their experience. Uh, and it was a successful campaign. Uh, the successes and the challenges and how uh, they managed to overcome those as they are prepared for another um, round of NOPV in different geographies in uh, Nigeria. I'll hand it, I'll stop here and hand it over to Iwan and Hayan. Thank you all for being here. Okay, uh, thank you, Erin. Uh, should we just uh, proceed with our presentations? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Ridwan Hassan. Uh, I'm the C4D manager in UNICEF Nigeria, working on polio. Uh, my colleague uh, next, sitting next to me is Hayon Nam. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, divide our presentations. So I'll take the first part. Uh, class, uh, next, please. OK. Uh, so. Uh, Nigeria was uh, certified as a, a, a wild polio virus free country uh, last year in August, uh, but of course we are still facing uh, outbreaks of CVDPV, uh, which started in 2018. Um, in the 2019, uh, we, have, we had 87 cases of which 18 uh, were AFP, uh, nine contact and 60 is environmental. Um, it was down to uh, 20 uh, cases uh, in the 2020. Uh, and so far uh, in 2021, uh, we've had uh, nine cases. Uh, and it has been going on um, both in the North uh, as well as uh, in the South. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, by using NOPV, which should uh, uh, pose less risk in terms of the VDPV, uh, it will help us eradicate uh, all forms of uh, uh, polio viruses from, uh, from Nigeria as well as in, from Africa. Next, please. Um, Actually, the work on NOPV started uh, quite a while ago uh, in 2019 and early 2020. Uh, we uh, conducted a, uh, study, a qualitative study um, in actually in three countries, uh, Nigeria included. So Nigeria, I think uh, DRC and another one is, was in Kenya. Uh, so we did the first uh, qualitative, qualitative study in terms of um, NOPV. Uh, we did this uh, one in the in the north, uh, which was Kano, and another one in the south, uh, which is Akure. Uh, the objective of the study was to understand the perceptions uh, towards polio vaccines and the NOPV, to identify key barriers and information needs uh, to uh, introduce uh, the new vaccines, and propose uh, measures of communication strategy. So what we found from the, from the study is that 
Um, uh, basically, the respondents or the informants were supportive of the NOPV introductions if it is proven safe and well tested. And they, uh, they said that there's a need for ma uh, mass sensitiz sensitizations and proper training. Uh, there were, however, some concerns about genetic modifications uh, and EUL, uh, emergency use listing, uh, and therefore nationwide mass sensitizations was proposed. This was uh, especially apparent among, uh, among journalists. Um, next, please. Uh, next slide, yes. So um, for the introductions of uh, NOPV2, uh, it consisted of two rounds. Uh, the first round was in March, 2021. The second round was in uh, April, 2021. The first round targeted uh, six states, uh, Niger, Sokoto, Zamfara, and FCT, uh, which are in the North or Central. FCT is in central uh, and uh, Delta and Bielsa in the south. So uh, uh, CBDPV2 have been uh, occurring both in the north and in the south. Uh, traditionally, we think that the north were more susceptible or more, more at risk of uh, having uh, a polio virus outbreak, but uh, with regards to CVDPV2, uh, it has also been occurring uh, in the South. Uh, the second round was in April, 2021, uh, taking place in seven states, uh, which were you know, coming from the, the previous round, plus KB uh, in the North. Um, the states were selected based on CVDPV2 prevalence and risk. Uh, and KB was added after a confirmed CVDPV2 case in March. Next, please. Uh, the challenges that we have and, and the context that we had when we introduced NOPV, uh, NOPV2 is that it overlapped uh, with the introductions of COVID-19 uh, vaccines in Nigeria. Uh, and therefore, there's a, a a growing vaccine hesitancy and rumors about the new vaccine. Uh, and the vaccine hesitancy towards COVID-19 vaccines uh, has an impact uh, on the uptake of, of, of other vaccines. Um, we had, uh, you know, cases where we had to uh, do training, for example, for NOPV back to back with the uh, COVID-19 training. Uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine training. So that's that's how it, it very much overlap uh, with the other uh, vaccines introductions. Next, please. Iwan, are you still speaking? I'm not able to. Johns Hopkins, PCP. Uh, uh, polling, uh, online polling, uh, for example, about 60% of Nigerians uh, are hesitant about getting the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and also, uh, we got the, the, the data on the right, on the right uh, uh, part of the slide, uh, where, you know, a lot of uh, COVID-19 vaccine rumors is circulating uh, at the community level. Um, but fortunately, uh, you know, based on our uh, uh, social listening uh, at the community level, uh, in the first month uh, when we introduced the uh, NOPV2, we did not detect any uh, rumor related to polio or related to um, uh, NOPV2. Uh, next. Next slide, please. So um, the, uh, the country uh, through the national EOC and uh, other partners agreed uh, that given the context, given the challenges uh, of uh, vaccine hesitancies, of rumors uh, circulating um, on the, on, on, on the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, we agreed that we will uh, uh, apply a low-key approach uh, uh, 
in introductions of, of NOPV2. Uh, we would not call uh, the NOPV2 as a new vaccine, um, but uh, instead we uh, position NOPV2 as an improved oral polio vaccines for children to leverage and, and leveraging on the established uh, high trust and acceptance of uh, oral polio vaccines. And um, in terms of the training uh, and also disseminations of information, uh, we, we segregated uh, the information. So uh, for, uh, for example, for uh, uh, health workers, uh, for a more technical uh, target audience, uh, we provide a uh, full uh, information, full technical information on NOPV. Uh, but you know, for frontline workers, for example, for the VCM uh, uh, network, uh, we uh, provide only essentials information. Uh, and uh, for the community in general, uh, we again, you know, we position uh, this vaccine. Uh, as uh, an improved oral polio vaccine. Um, however, as uh, Mariana mentions uh, in the last presentations, we did provide a full information on NOPV on the uh, government's website um, as, as, you know, as transparency of, of the introductions of these vaccines. Uh, next, please. So in terms of the activities, First, uh, we, uh, we did uh, talk to the uh, NTLC, Northern Traditional uh, uh, Leaders, um, uh, to get uh, their uh, approval or their uh, consent on the strategy that we, that we used. And they concurred that uh, there's no need uh, to introduce this vaccine as a new vaccine, even to the traditional leaders. So, uh, the, you know, they agreed uh, with us that we uh, treat this new vaccine as a, uh, you know, existing uh, oral polio vaccine that we have been using for uh, campaigns and outbreaks um, uh, all these years. And these are the messages that we disseminated. So we emphasize on the safety and the efficacy of the, uh, of the NOPV. OPV is safe and effective. It boosts the immunity of children. And uh, we also emphasize the need for repeated uh, uptake of, of, of the OPV. Next, please. Um, when we're uh, on the first day of the introductions, on the first day of the campaign, uh, we did uh, face some challenges. For example, uh, there is confusions among caregivers uh, about, uh, you know, COVID-19 vaccines and uh, uh, NOPV vaccines. Uh, there, there were some concerns among caregivers that their that children are getting uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, it was pretty um, uh, challenging to explain uh, the differences between NOPV2 and COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and um, unfortunately, this was not uh, fully anticipated. Uh, so um, uh, uh, in, in, in the next round of the campaign, this was fully addressed. Uh, it was included in the training and we developed some communications materials specifically addressing uh, these, uh, this issue. Uh, the other challenges is that a very tight uh, timeline uh, from the time when the our applications uh, to use uh, uh, NOPV2 was approved uh, and uh, the vaccines released and the time of, uh, of, of the first round uh, of campaign. So we only had like four weeks to prepare everything. Uh, and also uh, the other big challenge was that uh, COVID-19 took the top priority, um, uh, you know, uh, among the government officials as well as among the UNICEF officials within the office, to be honest. So um, uh, we, we, we kind of had to take uh, the, the, the back seat uh, in terms of the uh, priority uh, at the government, uh, as well as in the office. Uh, the other challenge was that, I'm sorry. <laughs> the other challenge was that the lack of experience in polio campaigns in the Southern states. 
uh, where they did not have, or they do not have the VCM network. And uh, insecurity and geographically hard to reach regions, especially in the South, uh, in, in, in Delta and by Elsa, uh, where a lot of communities uh, live in the river Rhine uh, areas. Next, please. Uh, so um, in the next round of campaign, uh, there were specific messages that uh, were developed to, uh, to clarify uh, the distinctions between COVID, uh, COVID vaccines and uh, NOPV2. Uh, and we, um, we intensify uh, active uh, social listening through talk walker and also online and offline the media monitoring to detect uh, and address uh, uh, rumors related to um, uh, vaccines uh, uh, and polio and NOPV2. Uh, we, we also did uh, uh, a survey uh, among our uh, uh, VCM facilitators uh, to detect uh, uh, rumors and misinformation circulating in the communities. Next, please. So I will uh, hand this over to uh, to Hayon uh, to continue with uh, the results that we achieved with this uh, strategy. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is Hayan Nam. I will um, cover the lessons learned and the results part. Okay, so um, what went well in our campaign? Okay, our major success was, as Iwan explained, there were no major rumors around the NOPV vaccine. Um, we explained before that because of COVID and uh, spiking rumors on the new vaccine, we decided to take a um, track and surreptitious approach on the introduction of NOPV. And that has worked well, and there were no major rumors around this um, actually new vaccine, but we call it improved vaccine, yes. And most non-compliances were resolved um, very well, especially the confusion between the COVID and the NOPV. When we explained to them this is our NOPV is an oral vaccine, and this is for children, most of the non-compliances were well resolved. And other success factors, um, we counted early advocacy and engagement of key stakeholders. There was a big difference in the states that engaged the um, key stakeholders early compared to the states who did it um, belatedly. And while we could not show it here, the April results has shown that if the states had adequate time and engaged the stakeholders early, the results are dramatically improved. So in April, um, we have seen that um, you see the LQA's um, results um, in the other slides, but that has improved significantly because the states had learned a lesson and they engaged the stakeholders early. And the line listing of institutions such as the schools, the Sangaya schools and orphanages and um, churches had really helped because um, that is where the children can be found en masse. And good team performance and training of all stakeholders who are involved in this um, polio round has been really adding to the success. And the most effective communication channels had been, um, number one was the town criers. So they are identified as the number one source of information when it comes to polio campaign, campaign information. Traditional and religious leaders are always our supporter and they are the number one refusal resolver when there is a non-compliance. Other people heard about the campaign from the radios and our health workers, volunteer community mobilizers, and the high level leaders who um, make their public speech about the support of a polio. Next, please. So we actually did have some non-compliance cases and we dedicated one slide to it. And confusion about the polio and COVID vaccine was actually reported from all implementing states. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, luckily and fortunately, uh, most of these um, non-compliances were resolved when we explained the difference between the two vaccines. 
So learning from the March round, we actually retrained our people with the messages on the difference between the polio and the COVID vaccines and asked them to include it in their community mobilization messages. And that has worked in April. We also had a persisting pockets of non-compliance, but these were smaller in number. So we had some political reasons and other felt needs. And overall, because Nigeria did not publicize the use of NOPB to the public, well, um, I have to be careful here because we did publicize it on the website. So those people who wanted to have more information on the EUL vaccine, um, EUL approved vaccine, they could find it on the website and the uh, health workers, medical staff and the state and the LJ people were trained on this. So if anybody is looking for additional information on this vaccine, they were asked to direct the person to the website and which will give them more and fuller information. But then again, we did not um, open it to the public that this is a new vaccine. No, we said this is an improved vaccine, but this is an OPV that we have been using for the past about how many years. And as a result of this uh, strategic approach, um, the frontline workers did not observe the rejection of the vaccine on the ground that this is an NOPV vaccine. Next, please. Okay, so um, data and results. Um, I'll show you the summary here and some slide graphs um, from this um, slide onwards. So result of the March campaign is shown here. Um, I wish I could show the April one um, for a comparison, but for the time's sake, let me remain with the March one. So um, we populated, um, I mean, we immunized actually more than the target population. We um, vaccinated about um, 7.8 um, children, which is 1% more than our target. And the LTA's result um, has shown that 75% of the LGAs has passed more than 90% of the coverage. Um, please note that Nigeria has a higher bar and standard than the global standard. Um, that is the bar we set for ourselves. And 90% is the passing mark for Nigeria. And 75% has passed. In April, this number has soared to almost 90% as a result of the experience and more time to prepare. Awareness of the caregivers total was 94.95%. Um, and the missed children was 2%, and um, which is, um, well, the child absent was the majority of the reason, followed by the not visited and non-compliance. And the number one source of the information turned out to be the town announcer, followed by the traditional leaders and the radio. Next, please. So I'll show you a couple of graphs. This is the reasons for the non-compliance by the state in March campaign. So you will note that um, child sick was a uh, majority of the reason, and this is another um, reason for us to go back and train the teams that the child sick and the polio vaccine does not affect the child or make the child any um, sicker than he really is right now. And we have reasons, um, next reason was no caregiver consent. Um, this is more prevalent in um, Bayelsa and Sukhothai and also Niger. Um, this is due to the tradition of the um, fathers being the decision maker in the family. So when the mother is alone in the family and the father is not there, um, the mother often refused to vaccinate the child. But um, we have uh, mobilized the traditional leaders to convince the fathers in advance and you will have seen the changes in the April result. Next, please. Non-compliance resolved by various um, groups. So as I told you, our traditional community and religious leaders are our number one refusal resolvers. They have always been supporting us. And when there is a non-compliance case, the non-compliance committee, which composes of these three groups and influential persons go to the household and they resolve the cases. So you can see that they have been a tremendous help to us. 
And in Delta and Delta state where um, there aren't many, um, where the traditional leaders influence is not um, strongly felt, it was the um, health workers and the community mobilizers who had to resolve the issue instead. Next, please. So our lessons learned. So Nigeria's communication strategy of not actively publicizing NOPV2, especially not as a new vaccine in the context of a COVID um, rollout has worked well, especially when the time of, in the times of a confusion and alarm around the COVID vaccine. So our lesson learned is um, let's please avoid the overlap with our major immunization campaign especially the one, a major one like um, COVID where everybody, especially the caregivers are involved and they pay a lot of attention. And any country that is implementing the NOPV2 should anticipate the public confusion between the COVID-19 vaccine and this um, NOPV2 vaccine. So prepare the messages and train the stakeholders and avoid any um, non-compliance or confusion in advance. Another lesson learned was prepare early, especially in the states without the frequent campaign experience. Alert the high level leaders and institutions in advance so they can also be prepared. Social media guidelines should um, be published in advance and all stakeholders should be trained. So they do not um, go on their Facebook or social media and publish the information that were uncalled for. Okay, next slide, please. So um, our next steps, we will continue to build the public trust on OPB and reinforce the action of immunization itself rather than focusing on the label of the vaccine. So whether it's NOPV or BOPV or the IPV, we want people to come with a mindset that this is a protection for my child against the child killer diseases and the immunization is important and is a duty. Okay. And the confusion about the OPV and COVID vaccines still persists. So UNICEF has developed the jingle and the messages to distinguish the two and we will air it nation, nationwide and we will start from the, well, it says June um, national um, immunization campaign, but we still have an OPB before that. So we will continue and uh, we'll start from that one. And we will deploy the teams early, especially to the states that has not had a campaign experience to build their capacity. And an important lesson learned also, and the next step is to engage the states early. The April data in the Southern states dramatically shows an improvement when they had the adequate time and when they were engaged early that they can improve the LKS result and the coverage of the children. So that is our next step. Next, please. Okay, so that comes to an end of our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we will take a note of the questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them accordingly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vidwan. Thank you, Hayan, for this wonderful presentation. Um, really fascinating and we hope very helpful um, to colleagues to hear about uh, the challenges that you faced in this first campaign and how you address those challenges uh, during the campaign and, and in the next one. Um, so a a uh, reminder to um, everyone on the call that the, if you have questions for Hayan and Ridwan um, or any questions in general, please use the Q&A box to enter your question. Um, next, we will have um, um, one more presentation from um, Anastasia in our Ghana office, and then we will have um, time for question and answers at the end. Um, but please, as you think of questions, the Q&A box is open. Um, please add your questions there and we'll prepare to respond. Um, so it was very um, interesting to hear from our um, colleagues in Nigeria how confusion and misinformation around COVID-19 um, caused issues in their campaign for NOPV2. And we thought that um, it would be um, beneficial 
for all of us to hear from um, some of the work that's going on um, with UNICEF Ghana um, regarding establishing a misinformation management task force and how they're addressing misinformation um, for, for COVID-19. Um, using some of the training that was um, provided as part of the, through the polio program for NOPV2 preparations. Um, and just one more note before I hand it over to um, Anastasia. Um, for our colleagues listening in um, French, if the English sound is too loud, uh, please click interpretation for French and select mute original audio. And you will hear the English um, more quietly and be able to listen um, better in French. Okay, with that, I'd like to invite Anastasia um, for your presentation on establishing um, misinformation management task force. Hi, colleagues. Um, so thank you very much actually for colleagues uh, Ridwan and Hayan. I, that was impressive and very useful for uh, us and actually just preparing to NLPV2 uh, introduction. And Mariana, thank you very much. You are right. The preparation of the strategy took us uh, like six months. Uh, we are lucky that uh, we don't need to we don't, you know, we are not yet introducing it just now in Ghana, uh, but it, it really just to alert everyone else, we just submitted and the, our strategic documents were verified. The template provided by HQ and Polio team is incredibly good. We will, we are going to use it for other uh, campaigns as well. But again, just to alert colleagues, it, just, it, ta it takes time because it's uh, so detailed, but so practical. So just to start on our example, we established misinformation management task force. Uh, and again, we are lucky that we are not introducing NOPV2 now, but we use this um, experience and time to establish the task information misinformation task force uh, using the COVID-19 vaccination. So a lot of training dashboard that we received from polio team was around COVID-19 vaccination. But as all of you mentioned, the, all the hesitancy around COVID and polio vaccination are now su such uh, connected between each other. So this experience will help us to be much more prepared for the next uh, uh, campaigns we will have. Uh, that's what we were keeping in mind and I will share with you experience of how we established and now run misinformation management task force. What you see on a sc screen is part of the dashboard of, uh, I think oh, a lot of countries have already access to the top worker dashboard. And this cloud of uh, keywords reflect what uh, people say online about vaccination. You can uh, tailor it on the keywords. Yeah, this one is tailored around vaccination and Ghana. Uh, and in particular, you would see a lot of COVID. So what you see now, it's very neutral and not so bad uh, a picture, but when uh, there was a one week before the COVID vaccination campaign started, the whole cloud was covered with the keywords such as death, uh, testing, infertility, uh, Africa, testing, and uh, guinea pigs, and etc. So I, again, I find very useful this dashboard uh, and partners, uh, government partners really use it in order to see the snapshot of what is going on online. We can go to next slide. Sure. Um, Anastasia, before we start um, for the interpreters, um, if you could um, speak more slowly so that the interpreters are able to um, keep pace for French. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's great. So we can go to the next slide. So the first thing, of course, we did, we conducted some, uh, you know, surveys, uh, and that's what we will also do with NOPV now. We are going to do a survey, and again, huge thanks to Polio team that were so quick to help us uh, in uh, um, developing and running this survey before the campaign. I'm sharing with you now some reasons of what people actually said about COVID-19 vaccination, uh, and that is actually the context where we are. What you see on the screen, these are actually the most often rumors and concerns that people have. And they we expect, and what we saw last year with the polio vaccination, that was very similar. And as all of you said, yes, we have a confusion between both vaccines. Uh, so the most, of course, the usual thing is that people rely on other people uh, uh, decision to vaccinate. So people say that they are waiting for pastors to take a you know, vaccination. They're waiting for others to take vaccination. A lot of rumors around that it is a testing on African population or it is an attempt to decrease the population. Next one is uh, the same. We said uh, more specifically, what are your concerns? And we see that safety 
efficacy, side effects, and the rumors around manufacturers and being a guinea pigs are the most spread. Um, next one. So that's how dashboard looks like. Uh, again, I encourage you to try and use it. And it's really simple. You know, uh, you can use a keyword and it will give you a specific uh, picture of how now, for example, what now people say about polio in your country or in our case, this is the, what people say about COVID uh, in our country. And it really provides us immediately the picture of how much people read this, commented on this, and what is the potential outreach of this. And as you specific, you know, in your uh, uh, filter, what you see here drill down. You can actually get a very specific things. For example, once we were asked by Gavi, can you give us a specific what people think about COVAX facility? And uh, specifically COVAX, actually there were some rumors saying that this is a foreigners or they are playing and not giving us enough vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. So again, as much more specific you are, as better picture will get, and you can get it in a uh, matter of minutes, seconds. And I, you know, I do this screenshots and I send them to our uh, partners or colleagues and it actually advocates for them to take action. Next one. So the dashboard is the first part of what how we monitor rumors. So the dashboard actually allows us to monitor everything what is online. Of course, all of us also have some media clippings. And as you see on the screen, media coverage also doesn't help. Sometimes they are full of direct misinformation, like in case of Ghana receiving expiring vaccines. Sometimes these are not deliberate rumors, but they're presented very negatively. And again, dashboard helps us to pick up them immediately and see the potential outreach. And um, when, for example, we say 43% of Ghanaians are vaccine hesitant, it's not true. It's 43% of uh, hesitant people I think vaccines are dangerous. Overall, 80% are positive. So again, it's very difficult, of course, to work in the, uh, real, in the reality when media sensitize, sensual, you know, make such a negative and sensational headlines. It doesn't help the vaccine coverage at all. And again, what we saw on a dashboard, the number of this negative reporting helped uh, us and prompted us to ask government to work with journalists and media and organize a series of uh, um, events with journalists and editors on actually more ethical reporting and more objective and evidence-based reporting. Next one. So how the misinformation task force looks like. Thanks to Polio team, Kashian, Mariana, I mean, I will not stop thanking you for because the, uh, this was a, actually uh, one of the most useful cooperation we had, uh, you know, in terms of how much uh, practical help we had. So we got all templates ready. In addition to online dashboard, we received a ready template for TOR for misinformation task force. So we immediately shared with government and we said, look, these are dashboard, it's available for you. These are current rumors, there are a lot, we need to react. This is a TOR, how your misinformation task force can look like. And we are available to conduct with you sessions, walk you through the dashboard and provide you some additional training. We all hear about misinformation, but do how many of us can distinguish misinformation, disinformation, ref, uh, response, debunk, when react, when not? So it is quite new, you know, that we live when there is so much rumors and so much misinformation around. So government was actually quite receptive and they were eager to have this help. So we received a template from Kashian and Mariana. We organized, uh, Kashian led several sessions for government to explain them some uh, tactics around misinformation and present them dashboard. So uh, we have a misinformation task force. We have a national communication uh, committee that uh, receives the reports and we have the more wider dissemination as usual in all campaigns. We go to religious leaders, media, etc. Next one. So misinformation task force can be, stay within, of course, the same communication task force you have, or you can have a smaller group of people really focused only on misinformation. Uh, and in our case, this is a Ghana Health Service, and they are social media and PR officers, part of the small working group. We have WhatsApp group where each day we post misinformation, we discuss how to respond, and then it can go, if it's something minor or very urgent, we just go immediately and provide response. If it is more strategic about framing the narrative, we go to communication group 
and we can uh, discuss with them how the narrative should change. And we uh, have also Drugs and Food Authority. We invited other donors. We invited civil society organizations because there are some very active in the terms of misinformation. And um, yes, Anastasia, just another um, reminder from our interpreters. It's very clear in English, but with a complex topic, um, if you could speak more slowly for the benefit of the interpreters. Thank you. Uh, so the TOR uh, has a clear tasks. You can tailor it, you can share it with partners, it's ready. Uh, there are also a lot of other useful templates, like we received a template uh, with the polio uh, rumors and uh, the text of potential response. We received templates of rumors log and how you can analyze this log for each uh, rumor to be classified on something that needs response or needs other tactics to respond this. Uh, and it was again incredibly useful to have all this ready because you always don't have enough time as with COVID. In some countries as with polio, with COVID we had basically five days to prepare to launch the campaign. Next one. And the next one. So in addition uh, to, next one. So we, uh, how it uh, how we you we work so we see uh, the rumor on online dashboard in this case it was about uh, blood clots so we identify this next and then misinformation task force after the training they are able to see how first to measure this rumor how to classify it does it have high impact low impact or in this case it's medium impact and then there are several actions you can choose. You can debunk, you can uh, uh, develop a separate narrative, introduce new narrative. You can wait and actually leave it without response, not to create you know, another wave of rumors, etc. So each time we decide what we do. Uh, and again, we have a templates that allow us to do it in a Excel spreadsheet and keep a track record. Next one. And then the response is just an example, but again, we received the templates of uh, potential responses and potential messages uh, on polio and how we can do this uh, on each separate case or more spread rumors. Next. And also we received visuals, which I found incredibly useful. In our case, we rebranded them to COVID, but we will do the same with NOPV2. Now we have all templates, we adopted them to our branding of Ghana Health Service. And uh, next, they provide already some narratives of the most spread rumors that or the concerns or hesitancy. For example, is the vaccines tested? What are the health workers opinion? How effective vaccines? So that's all the templates that we are provided by Polio team and that we were able just to uh, put our logo on them and use them and launch this very, very quickly. Next one. And some more examples uh, on the most spread rumors that we uh, got from Polio team. And next one. So uh, what we do, we do weekly, we do daily monitoring and response. We do bi-weekly meetings with task information group, like more formal discussion. And then, of course, we need to coordinate it with other groups, for example, National Communication Committee. Some of the topics will affect overall strategy. So if we see that the one rumor continuously repeats through different channels, then we need to change the strategy. And it needs to be discussed with the wider group. Next one. But what are the lessons learned and challenges? Of course, the huge benefit is that all resources were available. Second, uh, that through uh, starting to work with misinformation, we explored that there are a lot of other organizations that already provide uh, support, viral facts, and then some local CCOs. I encourage you to start this, uh, to explore this before, because we find out that some work was already done or somebody is doing it in parallel with us. So it's important to identify who is working on misinformation. 
then uh, please explore full potential of dashboard. Before, it's not just that it appears and you can use it, filter the keywords and then try to use this for a particular situation and you will see how amazing it is. And then of course, involving influencers for the response, religious leader, traditional leaders is very, very helpful. And the challenges is of course, to establish ownership with the government stakeholders. So it took time for them to lead on this and to prepare these responses uh, by themselves without our help. It takes time to, for them to make decision and distribute and react on rumors. Uh, and of course, establishing good distribution channels. So linking national level with us being on smartphones with the actually local level is a challenge. And that's what I learned a lot from previous presenters. So how they did it, how you establish it on a local level and work and address rumors uh, on the ground. And the last thing uh, that I want to mention uh, is just the way that we want potentially to take it forward with testing of our response. I know that some countries are doing this already through Facebook. Uh, we they are testing the potential response and misinformation and they see how it works so i think uh, in uh, all our actions what we are lacking is actually proper testing and evidence what works with uh, misinformation how you can address so that's what we want to try next is actually to run some promotional campaigns and see which message is perceived better engage better audience spread wider so that would be our next step and we are eager to learn if somebody already was involved i know ukraine did some experiment with facebook they launched some misinformation uh, and uh, mi launched misinformation response and they were uh, measuring what message worked better so that's something what we want to learn and do next thank you that's a very very useful event Thank you so much, Anastasia, um, for this fascinating presentation. Um, I'll invite uh, Mariana for a, a few words Thanks. as we finish. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Yuan and uh, Yuan. This were incredibly interesting, and we already have uh, a lot of questions in the Q&A um, section of Zoom. Uh, so if you can uh, just look them up and maybe provide some answers. I do want to echo uh, Anastasia is uh, that it, it also, uh, unfortunately and fortunately, uh, is a lot of work uh, that required for successful misinformation management system. But we have also learned that just the training is not enough. It's very useful, it can be done, uh, but it takes time and it takes uh, human resources to do this work. Uh, at the global level, we have a number of documents that are available, including misinformation management field guide that was just developed last year. Uh, no, excuse me, in the beginning of this year, which is very practical, very hands-on. Um, it's worth uh, reading and uh, I encourage you to, uh, to go through that document. We also have an amazing resource person, uh, Kashan, who is on the call with us here, who has been leading a lot of, um, of this work with the countries and has uh, a lot of experience already with the implementation of this work. We're also uh, closely collaborating with uh, EPI C4D team at a headquarters level with another amazing resource person, um, Angus, uh, who, uh, who has provided us with uh, knowledge and his experience both from private sector and uh, from uh, public sector. But also uh, he is available and uh, please feel free to reach out to ours or to Angus with any questions. Uh, on the materials, as Anastasia mentioned, um, we also have, uh, we prepared the pre-bunks and debunks, a whole big package of both messages uh, and uh, most spread rumors, as well as uh, visuals that are available and we're happy to share for, uh, for country offices to adopt uh, or to use as is, uh, it's up to you. Lastly, I wanted to mention that we just had a conversation with the Facebook project 
And many of you might be aware that the UNICEF at a global level has a partnership with Facebook where Facebook provides ad credits to UNICEF country offices. And there are some 90 country offices that are currently benefiting from this partnership. Um, they are mostly with uh, external communication teams, but uh, both partnership and us and uh, DOC are encouraging C4D colleagues to work closely with uh, external communication teams, uh, not only for the Facebook credits, but also um, for uh, media campaigns, etc. But I just wanted to mention that, that those credits are available. And if you will feel that you need more, uh, please feel free to reach out and we'll, uh, we can facilitate that uh, as well on our end. To uh, finish, I would like to thank every single country office that is preparing and implementing the campaigns. It's a lot of work, as well as regional offices in Wakaru, Isaro, uh, Ikaro, Minaro, Thank you very much for uh, for all the work and for all the uh, expertise that you are bringing into the table. And uh, I'll hand over to Erin for Q and A. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Mariana, and thank you again to our um, panelists today for your wonderful presentations. Um, and uh, Mariana mentioned a few resources. We will make sure to um, email out after the webinar. Um, the slides from this session along with the recording and we will um, include the resources and for the vaccine misinformation field guide um, Kishan is putting the link in the chat box. So before we go to Q&A we have one poll uh, regarding misinformation management. Um, on your screen you'll see the text in English and in French and then I'll bring up the, the polling screen where you can respond. Um, the question asks, um, in which of these areas would you like more information, I'm sorry, more support from regional office or headquarters for misinformation management? And I will um, give a moment for our French speakers to read and launch the poll now in English. So if you take a look at your screen, you should see the poll question. You can select more than one. So please select all of the areas um, where you would like more support and submit. So I'll keep this open for another 30 seconds. And once you complete the poll, um, please find the Q&A box and um, add any questions that you have for speakers. You should be able to view all of the questions that have been asked and answered so far. Um, Ridwan and Hayan have been uh, working hard to write some responses to the questions. So there's one tab to show you unanswered questions and one tab where you can see the answered questions. And I'll be sure to read through both. Okay. So we have about half of us have voted. So I'll close the poll now. And we can take a look at, at the results um, to help uh, regional office and headquarters to see. So there's certainly interest in each area, um, but managing online information um, is the area where the most support is needed. So we'll be sure to share this with Kishan and Mariana um, to help um, continue to support you in this area. Okay, so with that, we'll go into question and answers. Um, I'll start with so to ask your questions, um, as I've indicated, you can write them in the Q&A box. If you'd prefer to ask your question out loud, you can raise your hand and I'll um, call on you so you can ask your question out loud. We'll start with a few questions in the Q&A box. 
Um, I'll start with Guillaume's question. And for the interpreters next in the Q&A box for the second question, um, there's a question from Albert in French that we'll go to second. Okay. And um, so more of a comment from Guillaume that town criers are the number one source of information and traditional um, religious are the number one ref uh, refusal resolver. Um, in his experience, town criers are considered message disseminators, um, but not having all of this content, whereas the traditional leaders are opinion leaders. Um, and this is more of a, of a um, comment. So in, in other ways, um, look closely, how do you use the town criers and um, traditional leaders? Um, so can I in, invite um, Hayan and um, Ridwan to respond uh, to Guillaume's question? Uh, y yes, uh, we agree to uh, Guillaume. Yes, the town criers, uh, we use them uh, only to announce, uh, to uh, publicize the, the campaigns. Uh, and to mob, uh, you know, uh, to mobilize people to uh, to uh, to get the children vaccinated. So that's as far as it goes. Uh, but of course, you know, when it comes to dealing with the uh, non-compliance or refusals, uh, we use the uh, trusted uh, uh, sources of information, trusted uh, leaders uh, among the community, uh, such as religious leaders, the traditional leaders. Um, and they have been very, very active. Uh, so um, to, uh, yeah, on a typical uh, campaign day, uh, they usually have a meeting uh, after, you know, after the campaign to identify uh, uh, families uh, who have refused the vaccinations. And then they'll go back the next day uh, to resolve the issue. Uh, so uh, they have been very effective. Can I ask? Sure. Okay. Um, hi, this is Hayan. So um, we identified town criers as number one source of polio campaign information and traditional leaders as number one refusal resolver, yes. But then again, I have to emphasize the role of the community mobilizers. We call them BCM, volunteer community mobilizers. And they are the, actually the ones who are shaping um, the people's um, perception and knowledge and attitude and they change the behavior because they are the ones who um, visit the houses um, around the clock. They work um, 20 days a month and they are the ones going to houses and taking the record of the newborns and the routine and polio vaccination records and they speak to people. So they are known and recognized by the community and I have to acknowledge their role in shaping people's mindset and getting them ready to accept the vaccination. And on top of that, that's where the um, religious leaders and the town criers come in when the campaign happens. So it's a coordination and joint Thank you so much, Ridwan and Hayan. Um, next, we'll go to Albert's question in the Q&A box. And then I see Layla's hand. Um, we'll ask that verbally afterwards. Could I ask the interpreters to please read the question in English and in French? Could you provide some arguments to avoid confusion between the two vaccines? Uh, and yes, this is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I want to make sure you heard the question. Yes, this is something that honestly we did not anticipate uh, well. Uh, so uh, when we were preparing the campaign, uh, we knew that um, two vaccines, two new vaccines were, were going to be uh, introduced, uh, but we did not anticipate that the, uh, there, there, there was a small part of the community uh, who got the, uh, the new oral polio vaccines, uh, uh, you know, uh, confused with the COVID-19 vaccines. I, I guess that is a cause that is due to the, the high popularity of the COVID-19 vaccines. You know, it keeps appearing on the news. So when uh, people come to the house uh, to get their children vaccinated, they get it confused with the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So um, in the following round, in the second round, this was addressed. Uh, so this, uh, this also had become part of the 
uh, of the training content uh, uh, to the uh, to the health workers uh, and also to the state uh, to the state officials uh, and to the to the vaccination team. So when they uh, when they have uh, questions about uh, COVID nineteen um, vaccinations, they 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 were able to explain what are the differences between the two vaccines. And uh, also, uh, we are um, we're going to add uh, uh, radio spots to uh, explain the differences between the two. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the, the, the differences being uh, one is for adults, another one for children, one is injectable, another one is oral, um, you know, uh, etc. So, uh, but um, uh, you know, in, in most cases, as soon as this was explained. Uh, there's no refusals. Uh, there's li very little refusals. Um, yeah, hesitancy toward injectable vaccines is higher uh, compared to oral poly vaccines. So uh, in general, yes. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much. So next we'll go to um, Leila, um, who has her hand raised. And um, after that, um, the interpreters will go to Pascal's question in French in the um, Q&A box, um, followed by Rohi's question in English. Uh, Leila, go ahead. You should be. Um, able to speak. Uh, thank you very much. I think most of my questions were answered by Ridwan and Hayon, which were uh, part of was what is the demand generation challenges for NOPV2 introduction in the era of COVID 19? That was pretty well answered. Um, and of course, that all the countries have uh, top priorities. Uh, in terms of immediate outbreaks like measles. And, and I mean, we have a huge schedule for BOPV and SNITs and all that, and F, uh, a fractional IPV in Somalia before we even get to NOPV2. So that was well answered. And I also wanted to know um, what goes well. Uh, we talked about improved uh, polio campaigns but if we talk about the oral, oral uh, two, two, uh, do, uh, two drops in the mouth versus injectable, what is the effect on our routine immunization, especially IPV, is what I wanted to ask. And uh, the rest that was pretty much answered. Thank you, Ova. Okay. Thank you, Leila, for the question. Hayan and Ridwan, do you have a comment? Oh, uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, the, 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 the reasons why we're having uh, all these um, CVDPV2 outbreaks is because of our uh, poor routine immunizations coverage, no? And uh, a big part of that is the, the IPV. Um, uh, previously, uh, what we did um, uh, in the outbreak response is that uh, using uh, MOPV2 uh, followed by uh, IPV. Uh, as the, uh, we call it uh, um, uh, routine immunization immunizations true. intensifications. Yeah. So um, that, that was in the previous outbreak. Uh, um, parents usually are more hesitant uh, of, of getting their children um, uh, injected, uh, you know, because the reactions of children when they were being injected, you know, uh, many of them cried and everything. Uh, so um, in, in general, that, that, that's what we have observed. Uh, uh, but um, uh, thanks to the popularity and high trust uh, in OPV uh, in general, so this NOPV introductions uh, had, so far has not faced any uh, serious uh, problems in terms of the acceptance. Uh, so, uh, but well, I think- so yes, much. I think my question was more in, Beyond that, we went through BOPV, which we are actually in, in, in Somalia, and then we go with MOPV and then NOPV and then COVAX. So um, just to learn from your country experience, um, what was the demand generation in that way? Thank you, over, sorry. Yeah, I think that we mentioned this before. Um, uh, I think the, the demand generation should not be focusing on the, the brand of the vaccines or the level of the vaccines itself, but on the act of, uh, of uh, vaccinations as, as a way to protect children. 
because uh, if we get into uh, you know all these different uh, antigens, all different uh, ways of administering administering the the vaccines, uh, you, you know people have different uh, opinion, different attitude toward towards each of of, of the vaccines. So. Uh, um, I think uh, the, the the demand generation should be more focused on the the act of vaccinations as the way to protect children, uh, as opposed to uh, promoting certain uh, uh, certain vaccines. Um, no, so. Thank you so much um, for your questions, Leila, and for the responses. Um, next, we'll go to a question from Pascal. Um, which is in, in English in the chat box, um, translated. It's recommended not to mention the new aspect of NOPV2, but we also know that not all health workers are in favor of vaccine. And this information could come from them and could reinforce mistrust um, among the populate population towards the vaccine. Um, so did you see that or do you have a comment for that, uh, Ridwan or, or Hayan? Okay, Hayan will uh, answer that question. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we have not experienced um, the health workers um, negatively affecting um, the immunization campaign um, because of the information as such. So I cannot really answer your question, um, judging by the Nigeria experience, unfortunately. But I wonder if um, other colleagues had a similar experience in health workers affecting the campaign as such. If I may add, if I may add to that, uh, maybe this question is related to the uh, some of the health workers' hesitancy, uh, you know, uh, with the COVID-19 vaccines. Yes, we have observed that in Nigeria. Uh, there were some pollings that suggest uh, there are um, a minority uh, number of health workers who, who have hesitancy on the COVID-19 vaccines. But uh, when it comes to uh, oral polio vaccines or other antigens uh, under uh, routine immunizations, we have not observed that. Uh, according to our uh, polling among health workers, their major concerns when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines is its a safety aspect. Um, the concerns that these vaccines was developed in a hurry uh, in less than a year, uh, and therefore uh, they, they have some questions about the safety aspect. Uh, so that's what I can uh, tell. Thank you so much. And um, as Haya mentioned, if other colleagues have seen this um, in their um, circumstances, you can feel free to find the chat box and um, write your experience there um, to, to participate. Um, next, we have a question for Anastasia in the Q&A box from Rohi. Um, are there uh, community or traditional representatives in the uh, misinformation uh, task force? Yeah, a great question. Uh, so actually, uh, we found out, unfortunately not from the uh, beginning, that there is a very strong community organization called Wire of Facts. Uh, they were uh, initially uh, focused on elections and fighting misinformation to allow the fair elections. But then, of course, they once elections passed, they started to do another work. So they did a lot. But we didn't know about this again because they were operating in another area beyond mandate of UNICEF. So they did a lot already with media. They established misinformation capacities, etc. Now they are part of our group, and uh, we also plan to do now the more capacity development and work more with the ground level. So this is now a next step. Once national level is established, we need to go to the uh, ground level, and that's where we will work directly with communities. So actually, how to respond on rumors and misinformation. And again, I know there is a big research by um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Diseases on the link between online and offline rumors. So they do this work in DRC. You know, if we will hear something, we will also share with you. But it's interesting to see I'm sure there is a link, but I just want to see scientifically proved uh, 
how quickly you know it's spread because what we see in Ghana once anyone receive it on smartphone the person immediately starts talking to people that are not even having a phones so rumors do spread from online to offline but vice versa as well so I think that's another area where we all need to look how fast how they spread who provokes more online to offline or vice versa etc but there is a link definitely thank you thank you so much um next we'll go to um a few questions in the q a box um in french um first from armel um and then from pascal and then i see faiz mohammed has um, you have your hand up we'll go to your question after that and so could i ask the interpreter to please read aloud um armel's question thank you for sharing nigeria experience now that the campaign is over do you fear do you have the feeling that community could still do have the information about the vaccine that was used do you fear that the could that the trust could be undermined if they're discovered by themselves through other channels is it a communication issue to prevent from this situation thank you um hayan and everyone was the question clear Presumed any part repeated uh, I mean, until now, we have not faced any, uh, we have not received any questions or, um, or being raised about um, the, the community distrust in the vaccines, uh, the fact that, you know, they have received the new vaccines. Uh, so as far as they're concerned, they have received oral polio vaccines, um, uh, which has been used uh, in, in, in other campaigns, in the previous campaigns, in the, in the, in the previous outbreak responses. Uh, so, um, but, but we do disclose uh, full information on the NOPV to officially, you know, on the government website. Um, and if uh, there are questions, you know, from the media uh, uh, regarding the NOPV use in Nigeria, uh, uh, you know, uh, UNICEF has have been working with, uh, with NPHCDA, with the national EOC, uh, to address those questions. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so far we have not uh, received uh, any questions regarding uh, the use of NOPV2 uh, in, 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 in the outbreaks. Um, and uh, I hope that answered your questions. Can I go to that? Sure. Um, just to add, hi, this is Hayan. Um, just to add, the reason why we did not fully disclose um, or advocate on the NOPV2 as a new vaccine is because in Nigeria, new vaccine was being equivalent to the COVID vaccine. So once you bring it, uh, introduce it as a new vaccine, we are bound to fall into the confusion between the COVID and the NOPV2. But if you are asked a question, um, we can explain to them the full story and there is nothing that we are ex exactly hiding. It's just that um, we want to avoid the confusion between the two vaccines. And the uh, uh, narration and um, the training and the training packet actually um, has the full explanation of the how the NOPV came into being and how it is being dist um, distributed. And the uh, um, medical staff and the state um, people are um, explained, on, explained on the test results and the uh, um, experience that um, NOPV um, development has gone through. So if anybody wants the explanation, it is pretty open and we can explain. So that's how we lead it. Thank you so much. Um, Mariana, would you like to come in on this question as well? Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to echo uh, Hayon's point as well, that in the global guidance for NOPV, there is a very uh, good distinction between uh, uh, proactive and reactive audiences and what we uh, suggest, a ty what type of information that we suggest uh, to be proactively communicated to those audiences and uh, their details of NOPV and details of the vaccine itself is suggested to be communicated to a wider range of stakeholders, uh, medical associations, um, the entire medical field or those who 
could have uh, an interest, an opinion, a weight uh, on the vaccination campaigns, as well as uh, frontline workers. So uh, again, as uh, Hayon mentioned, there is absolutely no need or uh, the advice is not to hide the information. But we, if you look at BOPD versus MOPD versus TOPD, we have never really proactively communicated the type of the vaccine that we are using uh, to the caregivers. It's always been historically an oral polio vaccine. So if mothers, caregivers have questions, the information is there. We also, according to the EUL commitment and in the guidance, we also suggest that at a certain level of uh, community leaders, religious leaders, uh, it's context-based, but uh, there is a certain level of information about the vaccine that could be and probably should be also provided uh, to the community leaders uh, as well to avoid any rumors or mistrust. So just to conclude that no, the information should not be hidden, it should be provided in just different levels of uh, information to different types of audiences. Thank you. Thanks, Mariana. Um, Kashan, would you like to add? Yes, please. Um, further to what Hayon and Mariana said, I just want to connect it to misinformation. Um, what Hayon and Mariana was essentially saying that there is a difference between hiding something and not choosing to talk about it. And because this is a global forum, it's very important that we make that distinction. Uh, there is never a recommendation that we hide it. Uh, how much you choose to talk about it and how much you give it visibility, that's a decision that you need to take on the ground. That has direct implications on misinformation whenever you hide something and then eventually the community finds out, which they eventually always do, then that's a new story. That's a story that will circulate in the media and that will create a storm of misinformation in the community. So uh, whatever we do, try not to hide information around this. Um, there are tons of great examples uh, from countries that have already deployed NOPV to how they've smartly gone about sharing this information with their social mobilizers, with their frontline workers and with the community at large without making it the focus of the campaign for very rightful reasons uh, because of the complications uh, around public perception of the COVID vaccine. Um, so just wanted to clear that, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Kashan, for your, for your additions. So we are um, just about at um, 30 minutes past the hour, with, which is um, the end of the session, but we have um, one more hand raised and a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, if the panelists um, are okay to stay for a few more minutes, we can answer um, maybe two or so more questions. And if any questions remain in the chat box, we can uh, respond in writing afterwards. Um, and if any panelists have to go, please just write in the chat that, that you need to go. Um, so for next, uh, for the last two questions, I'm Faiz Mohammed. I see your hand uh, raised. Would you like to ask your question? You should be able to unmute. Go ahead. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you colleagues for uh, sharing your experiences and wonderful presentations for uh, our learning. So uh, as uh, colleagues also discussed, like the, the type of audiences that we are addressing, the proactive and, uh, and reactive, uh, and uh, for reactive uh, audiences, we should be emphasizing more on the general key messages related to OPV until and unless we are asked specifically about the NOPV and then we can share. Uh, but uh, in one of the presentation, the colleague shared that they did a CAP survey, and if I recall it correct, correctly, uh, he mentioned that there were some concerns raised related to genetic uh, gene genetic modification, etc. So I was just wondering, were there any specific questions related to new vaccine or novel vaccine, or it was just you know raised by the the uh, audiences or the uh, general public? Thank you. Thank you, Faya. So uh, re regarding the, the CAP study, um, um, Hayana and, and Ridwan, would you like to answer? Or Mariana, would you like to um, comment on this? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Arin. Uh, thank you, Mohammed uh, Faiz. Uh, so we th th there's no questions uh, uh, which we receive uh, regarding the uh, 
genetic modifications um, of the vaccines. Um, uh, this, this issue was actually raised by a group of journalists uh, which we interviewed uh, uh, during the FGDs uh, in the qualitative uh, study that we did uh, back in the early uh, uh, 2020. Uh, so, uh, but so, so based on that, so we did not uh, mention uh, uh, anything uh, about the, the fact that this was this vaccines was genetically modified. Uh, in fact, that that was one of the uh, key points that we. Uh, that we uh, raised during the training, for example, that everyone should avoid mentioning um, any word connected to genetic modifications, or um, we should, uh, you know, uh, we should avoid um, using uh, the fact that this is a new vaccine. So this this uh, this NOPV two should be positioned. Um, uh, strategically as an improved uh, vaccine, uh, just like uh, the oral polio vaccines, uh, uh, you know, that are existing and that have been used in campaigns and, 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 and outbreaks response uh, that have been trusted by, by the community for so long. So um, that, that was the, uh, the guideline that we provide uh, to the states and also the, to the health workers, to the vaccinations team. Over, Erin. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, so we have, um, take two more questions. We have a, a hand from uh, Rohi, and then we have a question from um, Pascal that we'll respond to. And then for any remaining questions, you can write them in the chat box and um, we'll send out the written responses. Um, Rohi, over to you. Um, good, uh, good day, everyone. I am Rohi, connected from Sokoto State, Northern Nigeria. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Ion and Hayon for that detailed presentation, presenting the insights from, you know, um, Nigeria, especially Sokoto, what happens with the NOPV experience. Um, first of all, I would just like to just add my voice to them because I see a question in the chat box from Pascal who said, what was our approach with religious leaders in terms of advocacy during the NOPV? Well, the C4D team of Sokoto, what we did was we engaged the district heads across the LGS in, in Sokoto to, to, to talk to them about the NOPV vaccine that is coming up. And we, we decided to seek their support and um, towards um, this endeavor. And that was a very good approach because they all welcome the idea of the NOPV and they also pledge their continuous support and ownership in, in making sure that they help the community generate more demand for vaccination. And the second point I wanted to also you know, stress a bit was I asked a question to uh, Anastasia from Ghana about religious leaders or traditional representatives in the MTF. Why I said that because I know that that is a very good approach perhaps not only engaging them, but you know, co-opting them to be among the community, I think that will do a lot of good. For example, sending them as their own messengers to their own people to, to interact in rumors and information, I think that will really help a lot. Thank you very much and over. Thank you so much, Rohi, for sharing um, this, ex this experience and for highlighting um, Pascal's um, question. Um, uh, would um, um, Ridwan or Hayam, would you like to, to comment on this? Um, or Mariana, would you like to um, comment on, on Pascal's question as well, which was regarding um, the approach that was used for advocacy with um, religious leaders? Um, and did they um, lead advocacy visits for each leader or was it a meeting gathering um, them all? Okay, um, so in Nigeria, um, luckily, we have a very structured um, system of um, traditional and religious leaders. We have a sultan and we have emirs in each state. And under the sultan, um, they form the foundation called the Sultan Foundation. And each emir and all the religious leaders belong to the Sultan Foundation. So cascading the information has been very easy for us. We engage the Sultan Foundation as a partner, 
and we, um, when we have our polio campaign or if there's any news to spread, um, we go through the Sultan, then the Emirs, and we go down to the community leaders and um, we do the training at the Emirates level, the LGA and the world level. These are the administrative um, structure of Nigeria. And eventually the community leaders are the ones who actually accompany each team during the polio campaign and resolve any non-compliance and, co um, and convince the caregivers to uptake the vaccine. So approaching the religious leaders has been um, pretty structured and um, relatively easy in Nigeria. I hope that answers the question, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mariana, would you like to add anything? And so this is our final question. Colleagues, if you need to go on to your next meeting, please um, feel free. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, I'll invite Mariana for, for a, a response or any last words, and then um, we'll close the session. And we will share the recording, the slides, um, resources, as well as um, responses to any unanswered questions. And Mariana, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, colleagues, um, for the questions. I just wanted to uh, make a small comment on the advocacy in general that uh, I've seen across the countries, we've seen uh, different approaches. Uh, we have seen a structured approach, as Hayan explained. There is also a practice where uh, the teams visit uh, each stakeholder uh, separately and uh, discuss with them. And there is also a very interesting tendency now to look at the stakeholders uh, broader beyond uh, medical communities, beyond just health stakeholders. Uh, if you look at the guidance note for the NOPD introduction, we do encourage countries to look at a broader um, network of uh, networks and stakeholders, uh, line ministries, uh, not just the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Transportation, if necessary, etc., to see who has the voice, who has, um, who is the leader of the opinion um, for the communities and for the country and for the political buy-in, as well as um, to, to, to support uh, the, the communities, as well as to answer their questions. So as I said, we've seen both approaches and both worked, uh, either a structured meeting or one-by-one -one meetings with the stakeholders and one-by-one -one meetings with the stakeholders at national and at some national levels. Um, we also have seen a bit of an innovation uh, involving private sector. Um, I do encourage all to uh, explore that and explore new partnerships for uh, NOPD introduction rollout and in general for polio uh, campaigns as private sector is quite interesting to work with and proven to be very useful. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, interpreters. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, uh, for and thank you uh, participants for your uh, time and I do hope this was useful for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you everyone for joining. With that um, we'll close the webinar and we'll be in touch with the resources and materials from this call. And um, thank you to our panelists, um, Hayan, Ridwan and Anastasia as well as Mariana and Kashan for all of your support in this session. And um, we look forward to our, our next session we can be together. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.